All right, welcome everyone. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which we are meeting today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, our guest speaker today is Dr. Prasad Paratka. He is from CSIRO um, in Geelong, the Australian Animal Health Laboratory. Laboratory. Come on in, sit up front. Um, Prasad obtained his medical degree in, um, in India, in Mumbai, before he completed a PhD at the University of Buffalo in New York State in 26. Um, he was then a research fellow at Duke NUS University in Singapore, um, did a second postdoc in, in the US as well, in um, Salt Lake City, is it? And um, then joined CSIRO about eight years ago. Um, he has a strong interest and is an expert on mosquito-borne viruses, including dengue, Zika, and chikungunya, and um, is interested in the development of therapeutics against those infections, and is currently focusing on mosquito-virus interactions and targeting the mosquito as a vector to eliminate arbovirus infections. Please welcome Prasad. Thanks, Greg. Uh, I hope all of you can hear me. Oh, great. Uh, so thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, give you an overview of some of the projects that I've been involved with uh, targeting the mosquito uh, in our fight against this mosquito-borne diseases. So, uh, all right, let's see. First of all, let me say um, this is not just my work. This is the work done by a number of staff, a number of people uh, around the world, including um, people from CSIRO, uh, people from uh, Melbourne Uni, Verily, which is a company um, which is offshoot of Google, um, uh, JCU, QIMR, uh, University of Queensland, and University of San Diego, who we collaborate very closely with. So this is sort of the work I'm going to show you is sort of a combination of all of these. So first of all, let me give you a um, set the scene. So mosquitoes are considered world's deadliest animals, and you may have seen this graph before. And they really surpass, uh, you know, the, what we consider the most dangerous, like sharks, snakes, crocs, uh, spiders, etc. And you get about more than 700,000 people die every year because of mosquitoes. And the reason they die is because of the diseases that they carry. And um, the main one is malaria, which I'm not going to talk about today. But the other ones are viruses which are carried by these mosquitoes. And these include dengue, Zika, chikungunya, Japanese encephalitis. These are the viruses which, are, which cause devastating disease or even death in a lot of people around the world. This is a map showing the distribution of the diseases. And you can see that more than half of the world's population is at risk of this infection. And this occurs usually in the tropical and subtropical regions in the world. Uh, but obviously, because of climate change, the, 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 sort of the distribution is always increasing. And another reason that, that the distribution of this disease is increasing is because of increased travel and trade. So an uh, infected person can uh, move from one part of the world to the other part of the world in a matter of hours now. Uh, there's a lot of trade that ha that's happening between countries which can move mosquitoes within those countries. Um, there's also uh, another reason is increased urbanization. And when I say increased urbanization is mostly this unplanned haphazard urbanization that's occurring in a lot of these regions of Asia, Africa, Americas, which is leading to a lot of uh, water problems and uh, increasing mosquito sort of density in these areas. Uh, one of the example and the major one is dengue. And uh, you probably have heard of this disease, of course. Um, the statistics I like to give is there are 390 million infections with dengue, this dengue virus every year, with about 22,000 deaths, and these deaths are mostly children. And this is the pyramid sort of showing that there are 3 billion people at risk of getting infected by dengue. Most of these people who get dengue out of these 300 million remain asymptomatic, so they don't show any symptoms of the disease. But they can still be uh, transmitted this disease through mosquito bites. 
There are a lot of cases which go unreported, but there is very small number which get this disease of very severity. So they get, they get a lot of rash, there is a lot of hemorrhage from the eyes and skin. Uh, and that's 500,000. So that's sort of a, still a big number, although it's a small percentage, it's a huge number. The cases worldwide are on the rise. You can see um, from 1955 to 2007, there is a huge increase that's happening with dengue cases around the world. There's also a number of countries which are reporting dengue cases is on the rise. So you can see a lot of countries now report dengue as well. And this is mainly because of increase in distribution of the disease and also more reporting from these countries. This is the current state of dengue outbreak. You can I just uh, sort of copied this map from uh, two days back. And you can see these red dots where you can see there are current outbreaks in last three months. You can see there are outbreaks all around the world, especially in India, in Asia, in South America. And you can see that uh, also Philippines has recently declared, declared a national dengue alert. There are 450 people have died since January. You don't hear about this uh, in a lot of media, uh, but uh, this sort of occurs sort of, a, uh, sort of in the underlying places, uh, including Philippines. The other example is Zika, and you may have heard about Zika um, in 2015 and 16 when there was huge media uh, outbursts because of this infection when it occurred in Brazil. Um, this map really shows the movement of Zika over the last 70 or so years. It was initially detected, uh, identified in 1947 in Africa, and it slowly moved from Africa to Asia to the Pacific Islands, but it really hit the news or media uh, when there was outbreak in Brazil. And the reason it really did that is because of microcephaly cases. You saw in the newspapers and the media, a lot of kids born or infants born with microcephaly. So really small uh, head with small brain, a uh, lot of uh, abortions that happened during that time. Um, you can see this graph where it says, uh, you know, um, there was increased incidence of microcephaly in, these, in Brazil in 2015 and 16 as compared to previous years. So you can see there was huge increase. Initially it was thought that it's just an association, so it's just more reporting that's occurring during that time. But now people have shown using mouse model and clinical cases that Zika was the cause of this microcephaly. It's not just the microcephaly which is the problem with Zika. There is longer term effects that recently have been found which are, which are associated with Zika. And one example is the Guillain-Barre syndrome um, which has been shown to be associated with Zika. Just last week a paper was published which showed that the infants who are born to pregnant women who are infected with Zika have below average neurodevelopment. So there is a delayed development in those infants. And this was done by a large uh, study uh, in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Um, and uh, so there's this huge, uh, so these are just two examples. One is dengue, one is Zika, where you have seen this huge impact on public health worldwide because of these infections. So. What are we doing? For, if you look at vaccines to prevent the disease, you can see only yellow fever and Japanese encephalitis virus, which are transmitted by mosquitoes, have uh, approved and really efficacious vaccines available. There's a vaccine available for dengue, uh, deng against dengue virus, but it's not as efficacious. It's not approved in a lot of countries. There's some problems associated with it. For treatment, there is no specific treatment available for any of these viruses. The only treatment that we give is sort of symptomatic. So if you have pain, you have fever, you just get treated for that and not against the virus. So current uh, sort of focus has been uh, for all public health agencies on mosquito control. And mosquitoes, because they transmit these diseases, the idea is if we can control mosquitoes, we can control the infection, at least if you look at the public health side of it. So how do we do that? So there are two ways, obviously. One is you don't allow the mosquito to bite you, or you also kill the mosquito in adult or larval stage. So if you don't want the mosquitoes to bite you, you put on the spray. It's insect repellent. You get it in any stores. Um, 
and you, go, you put it on when you go out of, out of the house. But then you can also use uh, insecticides. You can spray insecticides to kill adult mosquitoes. You can also remove any water sources where the mosquitoes can breed. Um, these, these sort of uh, um, strategies are very effective, but they have been sort of lacking now um, to, uh, to prevent the mosquito-borne disease. And that's because you can remove the larger, uh, larger water bodies, but there are these mosquitoes are so well adapted now, they can actually breed in very small amount of water which can be formed in these kind of coconut shells even. The problem with insecticide, the main pro one of the major problems is that the, because it's a spray, it can have larger ecological impacts. So it can affect a lot of other insects, not just the mosquitoes. The other major problem is the insecticide resistance. The more we are starting to use these insecticides, the more mosquitoes are getting resistant. And this is a map which shows, um, uh, well, the, the blue, uh, uh, blue color shows where the mosquitoes are present, but then the yellow circles and the red dots show wherever we have found insecticide resistance of different insecticides. So you can see that insecticide resistance has been detected throughout the world, and it is on the rise worldwide. So this is where we are. So at CSIRO and other groups have trying to look at what are the alternate strategies that we can do to sort of block this mosquito bond disease transmission. So first one, or there are two really major approaches. One is the uh, replacement of population. What it means is that this is a wild population of mosquitoes which can transmit the disease, you replace that population with mosquitoes which are not able to transmit the disease. And there are various strategies and I'll go, go through uh, to find out what can be done. The other one is population suppression, and this is what we have been doing so far, which is population suppression where you have a mosquito population, you try to sort of reduce this population. Um, and one example is using insecticides, but we are trying to look at alternate strategies, how we can do reduce this population of mosquitoes very specifically without affecting other insect species. So if you look at uh, suppression of uh, mosquitoes, one of the uh, sort of significant uh, um, alternate strategy that has been uh, looked at so far is use of Wolbachia. And this is called incompatible insect technique, or IIT, by using Wolbachia. Wolbachia is an intracellular bacteria. And this bacteria, when um, what has been shown, research has shown that when this bacteria infects a male mosquito, uh, uh, and when these mosquitoes are released in the wild, these male mosquitoes mate with wild females. Um, the, the eggs that are formed are not, uh, th so there is no progeny. So there is no, these eggs can't hatch, which can reduce the population of mosquitoes. So what you do is you infect uh, these male mosquitoes with Wolbachia and do a continuous release of these male Wolbachia mosquitoes in a population. And that reduces the population of the normal mosquito because the progeny doesn't survive. So this is one method of doing, um, sort of reducing population using this bac intracellular bacteria, in bacterial infection in mosquitoes. So uh, using this sort of uh, um, uh, so findings from research, we tried to apply it in the field. So this was a big project called Debug in Isfail. Uh, Innisfail is a small town near Cairns, um, and we tried to use this technique to reduce the pop mosquito population in that area. Now, this was a huge project. We identified three different areas in that, um, in, in, around Innisfail, uh, where we released these mosquitoes, and three sites were used as control. This obviously required a huge uh, cooperation and collaboration. What initially, and it required a number of sort of smaller processes that were taken. Um, the first one was risk assessment and getting approvals to do it. The risk assessment, what we have to do is, we follow a principle of cause no more harm. Basically what it means is we look at, look at what will it take if we uh, release these uh, mosquitoes infected with Wolbachia into the wild, what will happen? What's the risk of it? And if uh, it will not, it should not cause any more harm than it's already, already is causing. Uh, 
The approval process is obviously, as you can imagine, it's a lot complex if you're releasing these mosquitoes infected with Wolbachia into the wild. So the approval started from doing this research in the lab to from making these mosquitoes in the lab and then releasing it. So we had to import some mosquitoes which were infected with Wolbachia and do a back crossing with the local Wolbachia. So we collected a local mosquitoes from the population and uh, did a sort of mating experiments to try to make local mosquitoes infected with Wolbachia. But then there is a lot of approval process that goes into the government as well. We look at federal government, local government, state governments, getting council approvals. Also talking with the community is the most important thing. We want community engagement and uh, buy-in from the community before we could release these mosquitoes. Once we have these approvals in place, um, the first step is mass rearing. So we made a huge number of mosquitoes uh, in this with, with the help of James Cook University and QIMR in a large facility where they were sort of breeding mosquitoes again and again. Um, the next step was sorting. So what you want to do is only release male mosquitoes. You don't want to release female mosquitoes. Um, as you probably know, female mosquitoes are the ones which bite you and transmit the disease. So releasing male mosquitoes, there is no risk of uh, those mosquitoes biting people. So what we wanted to do is there is a machine, uh, sort of a technology from Verily, which can sort the, uh, the mosquitoes by sex. And we only released those mosquitoes which were male mosquitoes infected with Wolbachia. So once we sorted these mosquitoes, uh, CSIRO took over and uh, looked at how we can deliver these mosquitoes. So these mosquitoes were sort of released into the wild. Um, and also we did uh, vector surveillance. So we wanted to know how much of, uh, how much of we, uh, we are releasing, how much are we are capturing again, how, what is the local population of mosquitoes. And we also developed a digital platform so that we can track this over time and compare uh, with the control sort of sites as well. The most important thing, as you can imagine, is the sort of the community engagement. And it was driven by Nigel Baby and Catherine Dryden. These were, uh, we took a lot of town hall meetings. We, we talked with a lot of people. Um, and community was really in, encouraged to take ownership of it. They also, there were leaders who formed uh, part of this project advisory group. And uh, it was basically around open and transparent communication. We didn't want to make any decisions without engaging with community. And that was the key to, key to this project, really. Overall, uh, it was a large sort of operation. Overall, we in, uh, finally released around 3 million male mosquitoes, which were infected with Wolbachia. Um, and this was done through this collaboration with JCU, QIMR, and Huerily. The, the delivery system was done by this modified van. So this van was modified so that uh, this, uh, re literally this van went around the town releasing mosquitoes at specific sites. Um, and we released a number, and this was done every week over a four month period. Uh, we also uh, looked at the surveillance. So we, uh, we had traps put out uh, at different sites and uh, which collected mosquitoes. It went back into the lab. We sorted those mosquitoes, did molecular analysis to find out how, how much mosquito we are releasing is having an effect on the local population. Um, so this is the result we got. So this is the trap that we used to collect the mosquitoes. And we found that this red line is the, the, the treatment where uh, we released the mosquitoes with Wolbachia. And this green one is where uh, we didn't do any interventions. And we found that um, over the six month period, we found that there was 80 to 90% uh, suppression of mosquito population, which was really good to see. There was also no establishment of Wolbachia. What that means is only we mostly released male mosquitoes. So if female, mosqui female uh, mosquito with Wolbachia was released, it could establish into a population which we didn't want. Um, so this is in June 2018. We are still uh, collecting and doing vector surveillance work to see the longer term effect of this, trying to see whether the population is bouncing back. Um, 
and is uh, can we detect Wolbachia in this in this population? So this is just a result showing how effective it can be um, with this kind of effort. I have to say this took a large effort for the small town for reduction in population, but it was very effective. So if it can, so it can be done. However, we need to really streamline it for it to uh, to happen. The other methods of population suppression are uh, one of them is called sterile insect technique, and what, by basically what it means is you make sterile males using different technique. One of this is radiation, and uh, this SIT or sterile insect technique uh, basically you rare artificially mosquitoes and you sterilize the, the males using radiation. What this means is that there are no viable offsprings. So you make this, so you uh, mass rare these mosquitoes, you uh, sterilize them, and you release those mosquitoes. When they mate with wild females, uh, they, they, the eggs are infertile, so there is no viable offspring. So this has been tried uh, with other insects. Uh, it has been initially tried uh, with mosquitoes, but however, you can see that because of this irradiation, the, there is a fitness cost on mosquitoes. So these mosquitoes, uh, they are not as competitive in matings. They can't compete well with wild males, and the survival is reduced as well. So although it, uh, theoretically it's very effective, uh, practically, once it goes out into the field, it really takes a lot of release of these mosquitoes to have any effect. Um, the other side is using genetic approach to population suppression, and a company called Oxitec is sort of the leaders in this area. Um, they have developed these mosquitoes called OX513A. These mosquitoes are um, genetically modified so that they are sterile males. So you s release those sterile males because you, they have uh, sort of uh, deleted one gene. Um, and when they mate with wild female, there is no female present. So you only get male as a progeny, which sort of slowly reduces the population over time. So you can see the population goes down. You release these mosquitoes um, at, you do have to release a number of times these mosquitoes and the population drops. Um, the other side, as I mentioned, is population replacement. What this means is you replace the population, wild population of mosquitoes with a population which is incapable of transmitting a disease. And this, uh, one of the key sort of a project is use of Wolbachia to do that. And this is based around a research which identified that female mosquitoes with Wolbachia infection uh, cannot transmit the disease. So they had reduced vector competence for this dengue and Zika virus. Vector competence is basically um, ability of mosquito to get infected and then transmit the disease. So if the mosquito, female mosquito has Wolbachia in it, it cannot transmit the disease. And you can see in the graph here, the normal mosquito, uninfected mosquito, as compared to WML, which is the Wolbachia infected mosquito, there is significant reduction in the level of virus that it has. So using this, um, a, a larger project called Wire Mosquito Program was uh, developed and started. Um, um, the idea behind it is very similar to what I mentioned before. You release large number of these female mosquitoes infected with Wolbachia. So it, they slowly establish themselves in a population. Um, as you can see, this is the sort of the release period where you start increasing the population or releasing these mosquitoes, female mosquitoes infected with Wolbachia, and you stop at a time, uh, at a threshold, and they slowly, without release, they establish themselves into a population, and then all the mosquitoes in that area become infected with Wolbachia. And once that happens, then you don't get, theoretically, you don't get any transmission. So the idea behind it is you don't want to kill all the mosquitoes. You want to keep the mosquito in the population or in the ecology. And the idea behind it, again, is that um, mosquitoes may play some ecological role in an environment. So you don't want to get rid of all these mosquitoes. So you, you make them resistant to infection. They can still bite, but they don't transmit the disease. And uh, 
this is really a successful program, of course. There is a huge deployment that is happening all over the world. Um, and they use this community engagement, which is a key to this, where they uh, encourage schools and communities to release these mosquitoes infected with Wolbachia. Um, this has been very successful. This has been tried initially in around Keynes area, uh, where you can see uh, in Keynes area, you used to get this locally transmitted dengue um, every, almost every year. However, after the release, you can see there has been a reduction in dengue cases or reported dengue cases in, um, in, in the scans region. And you can see when they scaled up the releases, you can almost see uh, one or less than one case over, over this last four years. So this has been a really successful program. Um, what's happening now is that we are moving towards a new technology. Now, the genetic revolution has happened again with, uh, I'm sure you have heard of this CRISPR. CRISPR is, if you haven't heard, it's a new technology which people have been using to modify genomes. This was initially identified uh, over th about 30 years, 30 or so years ago uh, from a bac uh, bacteria. It's a bacterial immune system against viruses. Uh, and when used in combination with this protein called CAS, which is a CRISPR-associated gene, you can do a precise genome editing in a number of organisms, including mosquitoes. Um, you can, and by editing, I mean you can add a number of genes or you can take, uh, you can delete genes from these uh, organisms. The other concept is called engineered gene drive. So extending that CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology, you can actually uh, use this to drive this genetic modification into a population. What this means is um, normally you get this Mendelian inheritance system where if you have one, um, one of the parents with mutation, you, get, you have 50% chance of getting that mutation in, uh, um, in the offspring. However, in the gene drive inheritance, you get all 100% of the progeny inherit this um, gene. So in the end, you, uh, in normal inheritance, you get very little amount of uh, uh, penetration into a population. However, when you use the gene drive inheritance, all of the progeny get this. So you get this quicker, rapid, forceful, drive of this gene modification into a population. So what can we do with it? People have used this precise genome editing technology to change populations of mosquito. They have targeted female-specific isoform of this gene so that the females are either dead, uh, females either die or they change to males. So you, in, in, you can also introduce male sterility using modifications in gene. And people have shown that when you use this gene editing along with uh, gene drive, you can establish that population uh, or establish that mutation into a population within seven to 11 generations. So it doesn't take long for uh, the, this mosquito, if we modify it, to put it into the wild. It will get only within 10, seven to 11 generations, it can establish itself. and. Uh, so for example, when they introduced this uh, modification of double sex gene into uh, the female mosquitoes, you can see there was rapid reduction in the number of eggs that were, uh, um, um, number of eggs by the female within eight to 12 generations. So you can reduce the population very quickly. Now, the other method is called precision guided sterile insect technique. What so you have, I already talked about sterile insect technique, but what this does is uses this genome in editing technology to change this mosquito into um, making it sterile. Now, this has only been done so far in Drosophila. The reason I mention it is that this, has, this is now being tested for uh, use in mosquitoes using uh, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. These are the mosquitoes which can transmit Zika and dengue virus. Um, the idea behind this is that you make two mutations in mosquito uh, in the genome. So in this case, it, this was done in fruit fly, Drosophila, where it forms, uh, it ca causes female lethality and male sterility. 
So what it does is the progeny is sterile males. There is no females which are developed, only males, which, and those males are sterile. So you can see this is a modeling which shows the, this blue line is the line where you see this uh, technology being used. And you can see within days, within 84 to 100 days, you can reduce the population of the mosquitoes, or in this case, Drosophila, very quickly to, to almost zero. And you can see this. This is compared with the other systems which are currently in place, like Wolbachia or like um, the other sterile insect techniques. So this is a cool technology which is currently being uh, sort of tested in mosquitoes. And um, probably within the next few years, we'll see this being tested in the lab and maybe in the field. The, uh, when you look at population replacement using the, this genome editing, the main thing is, um, be, main idea behind is, is make mosquitoes resistant to virus. So I already talked about Wolbachia, which is a method to um, change the population so that the female mosquitoes don't transmit the disease. Here, we are using uh, the genome editing, so you can change the genome in a mosquito to make them resistant to infection, so that you break this cycle of mosquito transmitting, to, um, transmitting this virus to humans. The idea uh, behind that is you need some kind of cargo, which means some kind of gene which can be changed. And it can be antiviral gene, which can be targeted towards host, so targeted towards the mosquito, or targeted towards the virus. So I'm going to show you two different strategies that we have used in the lab so far against um, blocking this uh, virus in the lab. So first one is Zika virus. I already talked about what Zika virus is. Uh, but when you look at it molecularly, Zika virus has, a, is a RNA, has an RNA genome. So it's an RNA virus. Um, and it encodes for a number of these genes, or 10 genes. What we decided to do was, because it's an RNA virus, can we target this RNA using microRNAs, small microRNAs, which can directly target this genome? So we designed eight different microRNAs targeting different uh, genes of this virus. And we put it into a plasmid, uh, which was driven by this promoter called carboxypeptidase A. So what this does is these mosquitoes, when they blood feed, this promoter is activated. And the activation of this promoter will uh, sort of express these microRNAs, and they will be formed. and they. Uh, theoretically, they should kill the virus. So what this is doing, uh, this was also put, there were, we also put in this, promo, uh, this sort of a reporter gene called tomato gene, which gives this red eyes to the mosquitoes so we can differentiate them, these mosquitoes, from the wild mosquitoes. So when this, we put this, uh, the whole plasmid into, so we micro-inject this into eggs, and then we select these eggs so that the eggs uh, with this transgene can only be selected. So we selected this mosquito or mosquito line. We called it anti-Zika with the red eyes and then tested whether it can transmit the disease. And for that, as I mentioned before, this is the vector competence, which is the ability of the mosquito to acquire, maintain, and transmit a virus. So all three step, steps have uh, that virus have to go through. Then, um, and the way it happens is when the mosquito, female mosquito bites, it takes up the blood and the virus along with it, and it gets into the body of the mosquito through mid-gut. So mid-gut is the region where this virus crosses from the gut of the mosquito into the body of the mosquito. And then the virus replicates in the mosquito and goes into the salivary gland of the mosquito. So the, when the mos this mo same mosquito bites again, it's released into the next person or next uh, animal. So what we want to do is identify, if we want to look at the vector competence, we want to look at whether this mosquito is getting infected and whether it's, the virus is replicating in the mosquito and whether the virus can be transmitted through saliva. So we look at all three stages. We look at infection stage. So this is a vector competence. So we 
um, had these wild mosquitoes and his genome edited mosquitoes with Zika uh, and transgene into them. Uh, we fed these mosquitoes artificially on a membrane uh, with, uh, with blood containing Zika virus. And then uh, we look at, after four days, we look at the midgut of these mosquitoes to see whether they were infected or not. And you can see these are the wild mosquitoes. This is the level uh, you get in those mosquitoes in the midgut. When the mosquitoes had this gene which blocked Zika infection, it really blocked it completely. So there was almost no virus present in these mosquitoes. Interestingly, this was only the case for the mosquitoes which were homozygous. So there were, when there were two copies of this gene, that's when it blocked completely the virus. When they were heterozygous, so when there was only one copy of this gene present, the, the virus was still present in the midgut, but it was much lower. You can see there, was a, there is a reduction in that. The same thing we found in the body of the mosquito after 14 days, and we also looked at saliva. So we can remove the saliva from a mosquito, each mosquito, and then look at how much virus is present in each of, those, uh, each of the saliva that we collect. And you can see the, basically the same thing where you see a reduction in uh, or almost lack of any virus present in those mosquitoes, uh, which were homozygous, but in heterozygous, you see some virus present. However, it's a very low, uh, low amount. And this was done using different strains of Zika virus, just to say that there is no um, resistance developer. There is no sort of sequence-based variability which can cause this. So, uh, we also looked at, we went a little bit further where we looked, we did a mouse study. So this is a transmission model for mouse. So what we do is we feed these mosquitoes on blood uh, containing Zika virus and as allow these mosquitoes to bite um, mouse. So these mice are stat knockout mice which can get infected with uh, Zika virus. And you can see that when these, um, when we had wild mosquitoes feed on the, the mice, you can see all the mice died by day six, but when these uh, transgenic mosquitoes uh, um, fed on this mouse, you can see all mice survive, which means that, which suggests that um, these mosquitoes, which are transgenic, they don't transmit this virus. The other thing we look at is we made these transgenic mice. If we want to put them out into the wild population, they have to be as fit as the wild mosquitoes. So we look at different sort of parameters to check. Um, we look at the fecundity, which means that how many eggs each, each mosquito lays. We look at hatchability of those eggs. We look at how successful the males are in mating. We look at the development, we look at wing length, we look at survival, and we look at survival after infection. And it turned out that these mosquitoes were just as fit as wild mosquitoes, except in female median survival. And you see here, um, this black line, this back, black line is how long the females survive, the wild females survive, but this red line is how long the transgenic females survive. And you can see there is a difference. So you can, goes from the median survival, it goes from 64 to 54. So there is a reduction in survival of these females. We don't know how significant this will be in the wild, but there is some effect we found. So um, the other example is dengue virus. Can we use it sort of a strategy to block dengue virus in these mosquitoes? Now dengue virus, uh, I'm sure you've heard about this. This is very similar to Zika virus. The genome looks very similar, but there are four serotypes, dengue one, two, three, and four. And the uh, interesting thing about it is that, um, interesting or and devastating thing about it is that um, the person who gets a dengue disease uh, the second time with a different serotypes gets a severe disease. And that's because of this, this problem called uh, antibody dependent enhancement. So, it's a problem when the regions are hyperendemic, which means that multiple serotypes are, are circulating in the same geographic area. There is more risk of people getting more severe disease. And one zero, antibody against one serotype may not neutralize another uh, serotype. 
However, our collaborator, one of our collaborators, identified an antibody called IC, oh, so 1C19, and this antibody can neutralize all four serotypes of dengue. So this was published a while back in 2013. What we did was use this antibody and try to see whether we can use this antibody to block dengue infection in mosquitoes. So um, as you know, mosquitoes by themselves don't produce any antibodies. So our idea was, can we make a single chain antibody region? Um, uh, can we express this single chain antibody against dengue virus in uh, mosquito midgut? So we used the same plasmid as I mentioned before, uh, carbox un under the control of carboxypeptidase A, which means that this antibody will only be produced when the mosquitoes feed on blood. When they do that, we also have this, uh, again, use the same reporter so you can differentiate between wild mosquito and transgenic mosquito. And this is just different life stages with larvae and adults. And first we tried to see after blood feeding, does it, does, do these mosquitoes produce any antibody? And you can see here they do produce, this is a western blot against the antibody and shows that it does produce this antibody. The next thing, of, of course, was, is it effective? And we found that when we fed these mosquitoes dengue-infected blood, it was really effective. So it did produce this antibody and also blocked this infection, uh, getting infected and also transmission. So this is, again, very, uh, very similar results to Zika virus, where you see homozygous mosquitoes with two copies of this gene completely blocked infection in midgut as well as in saliva. Uh, however, heterozygous mosquitoes did have some infection, um, but it was much reduced in the saliva as well. We haven't done the um, mouse transmission study, but we also checked, so initially we looked at a dengue 2 serotype, but we also looked at other three serotypes of dengue, which is dengue 1, 3, and 4, and we found very similar results, which was very, this uh, mosquito was very effective to block transmission of all four serotypes of dengue. Um, so what does this mean? This means that we can make mosquito lines which are resistant to infection. We can also use this technology to suppress mosquito population. This will just depend on what approvals we get, what kind of strategies we want to use, depending on geographic location, depends on um, whether there is currently outbreak present or not. Um, these, the cargos that we have made can be used in, in combination with this engineered gene drive. So there is proof of concept that has been established that this engineered gene drive to push this, once we modified this gene in a mosquito, can be pushed into a wild population. And it has been used in the lab at least for Anopheles mosquito, um, and it can easily be translated to this Aedes mosquitoes which transmit um, dengue or Zika or chikungunya, these kind of viruses. The important point will be to have a social license to use this genome engineered mosquitoes. And what I mean by that is we need to get approvals uh, from government bodies. Um, we need to comply by them. So, however, at this time, we don't know who regulates this because these mosquitoes are sort of a transboundary uh, organisms. You know, they don't follow a specific country boundary. You don't know who regulates it. There are some now panels which are, uh, or boards which are put in place and they're still working through who should regulate release of these genome engineered mosquitoes. But there is a huge amount of research that's been put for drive reversal. So the initial fear is that if you have this gene drive which can self-sustain in a population, it will just multiply by itself in the wild can we stop it? Can we reverse it if, if we find that it's becoming a problem? And there is a huge amount of research that's going into that. The other one is whether we want self-propagating gene drives or should we be using self-exhausting gene drives, which means that after a while, they should uh, lose their ability to have this transgene or this transgenic mosquitoes and revert back to wild mosquitoes by itself. And that's where cutting edge research that's happening right now. 
And one of the most important thing, although it's the last point here, it's the most important thing, is the community engagement with any of this genome engineering technology. Whether the public want this kind of research into the wild. And that will require a um, number of consultations, obviously, but also uh, keeping the public uh, abreast about all these kind of new technologies. What are the risks? What are the advantages of it? So, can we control arboviral transmissions? And there are, as I showed you, there are multiple approaches that are being used currently to target mosquitoes, including Wolbachia, including sterile insect techniques. There's genome engineering, which is now showing a lot of promise. There's gene drive to push that pop into the population. There are a lot of other strategies which I have not discussed. There are new techniques people are using, combination of the using Wolbachia and sterile insect technique, which has recently, just last week, a paper was published showing it has been really effective in reducing uh, a population of mosquito in China. A fungus which has been used to uh, sort of uh, infect mosquitoes and that can be self-propagated to reduce the population of mosquitoes. Also, people have used predatory fish to reduce the population of larvae in, a, in, in uh, sort of a water body. This is a really complex problem, and we think that it has to be done in conjunction with vaccine and therapeutic development. People have focused in different areas, but for if we want to really control this arboviral transmission, it has to be done in part with a lot of research has to focus on not just vector, but also vaccine and therapeutic development. Even in um, what I've showed you today, um, the, the sort of the impact of this research has started to look in the field. But right now, this is all based on a lot of basic research that has gone on for the last 50 years or so, looking at how mosquitoes behave in the wild, how mosquitoes are caught, wild mosquitoes, how mosquitoes are um, behave in a cage. So, there's a huge amount of research that has gone into this and um, will be required if we want to really tackle this transmission issue. So I'll stop there and uh, take any questions if you have. Thank you very much, Prasad. We got plenty of time for questions. Um, if you attended last week's Wednesday seminar, we got these really cool new microphones and to make it a bit more fun, I'm I was told not to kick it, which probably would be more precise in my case, but please go ahead with questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, is this working? Yeah. Yes, I think so. Um, so what's the, I mean, how difficult is it to drive um, homologous um, drain transfer into these like mosquito populations? I mean, you say you got, um, you know, a, f a small effect or, you know, a midway effect when you've got heterozygous mosquitoes, but a definite, like, fully blocking effect in homozygous mosquitoes. Uh, How difficult is that to achieve? It's not very difficult to achieve. And if we have a lot of... Um, um, so we didn't go to more than 10 generations, but if we had gone much longer, it, we would be able to achieve that. We would be able to easily achieve homozygous which would completely block the infection. Mm -hmm. And that would be the ideal case where we, we wouldn't release heterozygous mosquitoes anyway. It mm -hmm. would be, have to be homozygous. Can I just ask another question? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I guess you've got a lot of problems with community engagement and you know, uh, you know, acceptability of these different um, interventions. I mean, for us, it seems like a no-brainer that you know, a mosquito population that's genetically modified that's going to reduce your kids, um, you know, chances of getting, you know, a horrible disease should be acceptable. What sort of um, problems or, or issues has been the main issue that you've faced in community acceptance of these? So we haven't done community engagement yet for the genome engineered mosquitoes. We have done it for uh, Wolbachia, of course, and it was accepted pretty. Uh, we didn't find too many uh, problems with it. So with Wolbachia, um, the main issue that people had was, if it bites people, can it transmit Wolbachia into people? 
and the other one was can it affect other insects? And we had those studies already done, and these studies have been done by other people as well to find out whether that can happen. Uh, we wouldn't think that would happen, and that doesn't happen. So that was part of that risk assessment that went in. The genome engineering, it's obviously, as you can imagine, a more complex because you don't, or people, um, general public, don't want um, scientists releasing this genome engineered mosquitoes into the wild. Um, the idea behind, we just have to make that argument to about how safe it is. And there, I expect there always will be some kind of resistance from people whose minds we may, we may not be able to change. But I personally believe that there is this, uh, the, this, uh, the advantage is sort of uh, way much higher. So, you know, if we can completely remove dengue or Zika infections from, a pop from affecting a population, we almost have a responsibility to use that with community engagement and not, and not just keep it in the lab. So that's my personal view. But uh, yeah, people, um, there's a group uh, actually in, from UK who recently released some transgenic mosquitoes in um, Burkina Faso. This was to block malaria infection. Um, and um, they did go through a lot of community engagement. In Africa, it's a bit different. Um, you don't have, you know, there are people dying from malaria, so you, People are seeing yeah, their relatives and kids die of malaria, so they are more accepting of the fact that uh, you know transgenic mosquito, if they are helping, that's good. Um, but then there is companies like Oxitec who are also releasing these transgenic mosquitoes in different parts of the world, including U.S. in Florida. They did some releases, um, um, and in um, if I believe in South America, they are doing some releases as well. And um, if the, the way they sort of sell it is that the effects are, um, it's sort of self, they are self-exhausting. So, you know, it's population suppression. So this genome modification doesn't stay in a population longer. And those kind of experiments have to be done. Sorry, long-winded answer and not really right, maybe correct answer, but yeah. Thanks. It's a complex question. Sarah, certainly is. <laughs> I have a, Sorry. hi. Just here. Um, I have a sort of an ethical question. With the gene drives that produce 100% sterility in the offspring, do you see that as a feasible approach for controlling mosquito populations? Since, like, I mean, to me, the ecology of, is so much more important than just people. Not that obviously <laughs> we have to control the situation, but there, you know. Um. Other yeah. ways of not transmitting the virus seem. Yeah. More so uh, more and more now people are not talking about um, sort of a self sustaining population suppression. They're more talking about sort of self exhausting population suppression. So you put this, uh, what they call as daisy drive. So um, one drive is not dependent on the or, or is dependent on the other drive. So it's. Um, what happens is, okay, let's say there is drive A, drive B, and drive C, and A is dependent on B, B is dependent on C, but A is not actually gene-driven, so it dies off after the release, after you know a few months, and so does B, because it's dependent on A, and so does C, which is the actual drive which you want to do. So this kind of daisy drives, people are thinking of using more and more. So. You don't want to completely change the ecology uh, for longer duration, but maybe in an outbreak situation or in case there is huge mosquito population which you predict will cause an outbreak, that kind of situation, maybe you can use that kind of, those technologies. Yeah. There's a question there. I'll go, run around. It's kind of sporty data. <laughs> um, I want to ask, following from that question, actually, um, what would be the environmental impact of taking mosqui mosquito out of the ecosystem? Uh, like even for yeah. a short period of time, of course. would that be yeah. a big impact? There's different views to it. Um, mosquitoes do play an ecological role. So they are food source for things like bats or 
uh, other birds. So it can play some, they are also pollinators, so you don't want to take them completely out of the ecosystem. At the same time, um, there is a um, view that these mosquitoes which transmit the disease are very limited, as in there are more than 3,000 species of mosquitoes around the world. But the mosquito species which actually transmit the virus are, you can count them really, you know, Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus, those are very specific species. So with this kind of technology, you can reduce the population. And those are invasive, so they are not normally, they, they were not here for generate, you know, for um, thousands of years, for example. So if you remove them, that should not change the ecology too much. But, so there are different views to it. Um, um, and that's the best I can answer I can give you, I guess. Yes, sorry. No, you can't. No, you can't, why You can't. <laughs> You know, um, I was really struck by your results with your SCFV um, yep. into um, mosquitoes. I'm sorry, I can't remember the antibody Dengue, name. Yeah. And so, you know, when the mosquito takes the blood meal, it's got the human human blood in it. Yep. How, how did you decide whether to go with an SCFV format or to actually have um, immune function on the antibody? Is there any need that you can actually harness what's in the human blood meal to enhance the inhibition? Hmm. Um, we haven't thought about that. Um, so you're asking whether human, uh, the antibody present in human blood would have an effect? Is that, or, or some other yes, immune? Or, or like immune function that's coming from okay. the blood meal, like either complement or ADCC, hmm. you know, because you've got, yeah, whether or not that would actually enhance um, the function of the antibody you put into okay. the, the uh, mosquito. We haven't actually thought about that, uh, um, but that's a good point. So something in the human, infected human blood that would activate the antibody or enhance the antibody rather. Exactly, like, so for like, especially for dengue where yeah. you have antibody dependent. Yeah, tox, enhancement. You know, whether or not actually putting an immune function on, on the antibody side would help. Yeah, that's, yeah, we, yeah, good point. That's good, uh, we haven't thought about that. More questions? I got a question. Um, there's, um, it, along the um, CRISPR approach, what's your long-term prediction, I mean, uh, it was recently found that, you know, against in other organisms such as mice, that CRISPR editing actually induces an antibody response mm -hmm. against CRISPR. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yep. which makes totally sense because it's coming from bacterium. Um, what are your prediction about long-term hmm. effects in a, well, mosquito doesn't have antibodies, but yeah, what are your predictions as long-term effects towards that gene editing? Um, there is some research that has been gone into this and people have found that after, um, I can't remember how many generations, that uh, the effect to all, the, the mosquitoes developed sort of a resistance to CRISPR. So if you keep it too long in a population, the CRISPR in a population, it may lose its ability to have that genetic modification. So I predict very similar to uh, mouse where um, they may lose out that modification at some stage. It depends on where that, um, people have shown that depending on where you have inserted or made those changes also affects it. So depending on if one gene is used versus the other, like conserved gene versus non-conserved gene, you can see whether resistance develops or not. If you release um, any of those gene edited mosquitoes into the wild, um, Along your data, um, it's indicated that the wild type animals outcompete the gene modified to a certain. In one of the aspects, at least, yeah. Yeah, so longevity is uh, impacted mm. and so on and so on. Yeah. Would you say that you have constantly to release those gene modified animals into a wild? And wouldn't be that also a. Um, economical question. I mean, they, they, these approaches are probably incredibly expensive, right? Yeah, these are. So all um, multiple release, and it, we would expect at least multiple releases for any technology to take an effect. And it is an economical question. Even with Wolbachia, it, it is an economical question. We can do it in a country like Australia, for example, in small areas where um, 
sort of rich country, you can say, Australia, compared to some other countries. So who pays for this is another question, definitely. Um, we need to make this as um, cost-friendly, if you can say, about that. So, And that's another question that we struggle with, that we are developing all this technology, but who will pay for it to be uh, applied in the field, in, in the areas where it's most needed are poorer areas, tropical poorer areas. So yeah, that's a good point. Katarina. So that was successful. That's got a good start. Um, I guess I have a question regarding the sort of more um, original antigenic sin kind of thing that you alluded to in the, in the dengue yep. serotypes. Um, not sure whether it's, or what, do you know whether anybody exactly knows what's happening or whether your system could even help trying to figure some of this stuff out? Because I think a lot of the problem is sort of immune system driven, which you might not have in these mosquitoes. Um, so I guess there are two questions in it. And I think there's also a, a correlation between dengue and then Zika later on. Mm -hmm. So I guess the easy question would be, have you, have you tried to infect those mosquitoes then with Zika? And does that help? It doesn't. So it, this antibody doesn't block Zika infection, so they get as they get infected as much as uh, wild mosquitoes, yeah. Mm. And then could you use it as a sort of research tool to then come in with some of those anti other antibodies and see what's actually, like, where the sickness actually then comes from later, whether it mm. still works in mosquitoes or whether you need, I don't know. No. I have to think about that one, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's a oh. good idea. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, don't know though. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. <laughs> All right, if there are no more questions, um, please join me in thanking Prasad for an excellent talk. <laughs> <laughs>